the Natural Selection. Hello, and welcome to another thrilling instalment of the Natural Selection podcast, brought to you from the University of Exeter's Centre for Ecology and Conservation. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Natalie Swain Diaz. And I'm Alice Brown. This week, we will be looking at the impact microplastics are having on our oceans and interviewing Professor Tamara Galloway about her paper. The impact of polystyrene microplastics on feeding, function and fecundity in the marine copepod Calinus helgolandicus. Copepods are a group of zooplankton and are really important in global marine food webs. Professor Galloway's work focuses on marine pollution, the human health effects of pollutants and the sustainable development of novel materials and substances. Interviewing today are Natalie Swain-Diaz and Fiona Birch. So, hello Tamara, nice to meet you. How hello, are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today for our Natural Selection podcast. So firstly, what exactly are microplastics and where do they come from? Microplastics are the tiny pieces of plastic that are formed when larger pieces of plastic or marine debris break down in the ocean. Um, So things like um, packaging materials and ropes and fibres from clothing. And other microplastics are things that we've actually produced to be of a small size. So we deliberately make microbeads, for instance, to put into certain cosmetics so that they can have an exfoliating action on the skin. We also um, have microplastics that are formed as nurdles, and these are tiny little pellets of plastic that are produced, and that's the way that plastic is transported around um, by the plastic industry from place to place. So then why are microplastics a concern? Well, microplastics are a concern because of their size range. Because they're tiny, from nanometer size up to micron size, their size overlaps with the kinds of organic particles that a lot of marine animals eat for their food. And the idea is that many of these animals, filter feeders and detritus feeders, are non-selective in their feeding and they may ingest plastics along with their food. And that's the concern. So you focus on the copepod, which is a class of zooplankton for this study. Uh, Why did you choose it for your research? Copepods are important because they're one of the most abundant items of the zooplankton. And that means there are many hundreds of millions of them floating around in the top layers of the ocean. And they're important as part of the trophic food web. So they consume phytoplankton, which takes energy from the, the sun, and they turn it into carbon. And that carbon and lipid is then passed up the food web to fish and other organisms that eat the copepods. So they're an integral part of the marine food web, and that's why we're interested in them. And with your study, what were you expecting to find? Um, Well, our hypothesis was that the ingestion of plastic, because copepods have to eat constantly to maintain um, their position in the food web, they need plenty of energy to be able to float in the, the surface of the ocean and to put on weight. Our hypothesis was that if they were consuming a non nutritious item along with their food, then they would put on less weight. If we studied them for um, a significant period of time, that decrease in um, weight and in energy and lipid would become evident as a decrease in their reproduction. So what we were expecting to find, or our hypothesis was, that feeding on plastic would affect their reproductive output. And how did you go about collecting and measuring your data? Um, We um, do a lot of field work, but these particular studies were done in the laboratory Um, We brought copepods back to the aquarium, so these were collected off the the, um, south coast of England by the Plymouth Quest, which is the um, research marine vessel owned by the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. We do a lot of our work with the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. We brought the copepods back to the um, aquarium and then we cultured them for periods of time with plastics um, in the aquarium and with their normal food. And then we measured a whole range of different growth and reproductive um, outputs. So are there any benefits or even drawbacks to doing studies in the lab as opposed to researching in the field? Well, of course, if you do research in the field, you find out what's really happening. So it's very ecologically relevant, but you can't always control what you're doing. Whereas if you do experiments in the laboratory, um, you could argue that they're less ecologically relevant, but at least you can control everything. So you can control, control the temperature and the number of your animals and how long you keep them for. So the benefits of uh, working in a laboratory, especially when you're measuring very discrete endpoints, is that um, you can actually practically do the experiments. So did your study do anything that has never been done before? 
Well, we, what we did to be able to see where the, the tiny plastic particles went in the copepods' bodies, we used bioimaging um, techniques that are typically only used with, with humans for medical purposes. So we used some incredibly sensitive bioimaging um, Raman spe spectrometry techniques that use lasers, infrared lasers, to look deep within the tissues of the animals. Um, by doing that, we were able to look inside the animals without actually dissecting them and determine exactly where the plastics went. So that was pretty incredible. Yeah. So overall, what did you find and was it what you expected? What we found was that even uh, when exposed to very small quantities of plastic in comparison to the amount of algae that was available to the animals, there was a significant effect on their reproductive output. So we didn't find that the animals died, their mortality was very low, and that's perhaps to be expected because we know plastics aren't acutely toxic, they're just something that floats in the ocean. What we did find was that um, the animals produced the same number of eggs, so their reproductive output was the same, but the eggs were smaller in size, and the size of the eggs that a copepod makes are very closely connected with how much energy it gets from its food. So basically, it needs more energy in its food to be able to produce viable eggs. Um, the eggs were smaller and they hatched less well. So actually, the, the um, fecundity of the animals had been reduced. What would you say uh, the impact was on the feeding of the copepods? We know from our previous experiments that um, if you feed copepods with algae um, that have increasing concentrations of plastic, um, the, the feeding on the algae will be reduced. So as you increase the plastic, the amount of algae that the animals eat is decreased. In these particular experiments, we were using very small quantities of plastic. Um, so although their feeding wasn't affected a great deal, um, it was decreased sufficient to lead to a decrease in their growth. If there was accumulation of microplastics affecting the feeding of these copepods, do you think that an accumulation within the food chain would be possible? Uh, would it have knock-on effects to larger predatory animals? I mean, it's certainly possible. A lot of the studies that we've done in the lab have shown that um, uh, plastics can be ingested by a wide range of animals and then they move from the gut and they can be distributed into the tissues and they can stay there for several weeks. And that does raise the possibility if, that if those animals are eaten during that time, then the animal and the plastic that it contains will be passed up the food web what we don't yet know is whether that has any significant effect compared to any other kind of stressor. Do you think that there are certain marine species that would be more likely to be impacted by marine plastics than others? I think you've got to look at the ocean and, and look at the kinds of animals that live in different layers. Um, the kinds of plastics that float on the surface are the less dense buoyant plastics the kinds of plastics that sink to the, the sediment bottom are the more dense ones. The kinds of animals that they're likely to affect are animals floating in the surface layers and animals living in the sediments at the bottom. At the moment we don't yet know whether there is a particularly sensitive or vulnerable species, but we can start to look at the habitats. We, we know from a lot of the surveys that have been done where we're finding build-up of plastic in the environment, and those are the obvious places to start to look. So the zooplankton you looked at was sampled from the Western English Channel. So does that mean that the microplastic uptake could be occurring in the English seas? Definitely. There is uptake occurring um, in the English Channel. We, we have um, several research students at the moment who are doing research in, into this area. It's really hard with tiny marine organisms to be able to take them back to the lab and find out what's in their guts. You need very, very sensitive methods. We know there, there are other researchers who've been studying what's present in the guts of fish, for instance, from the English Channel, and they're very definitely finding plastics present in the, the, in the guts of fish swimming about um, the surface waters and the, um, and the lower, the, the deeper waters of the, of the English Channel. So I guess the long answer is yes, or the short <laughs> answer is yes. And is there any evidence from your own or other people's research that microplastics can have a negative impact on humans by entering our food? Well, that's the million dollar question, I think, isn't it? Some of the research groups in the Netherlands have, have measured the amount of microplastic that they're finding in um, bivalves and seafood cultured for human consumption. 
and they've done some estimates based on those studies of how much plastic they think the average person might be consuming if you have say one seafood meal a week and their suggestion was that you could be consuming up to 11,000 tiny pieces of plastic a year wow. in your diet it sounds an awful lot what we don't know is well does that have any effect yeah. is it is it just something that passes through our gut and doesn't matter gosh so really what can be done to prevent microplastics entering the oceans use less of them <laughs> i think we need to as a society we need to look at what we're throwing away and get a have a reality check it's become almost accepted that you will throw things away immediately after you've used them. We heard some estimates from colleagues in the British Plastics Federation in support of the plastic bag ban, and they had estimated that the average plastic bag is only used for 20 minutes before it's discarded. So we're producing things that we're only ever going to use for 20 minutes and then we're going to throw them away. And you've got to ask, well, why do we do that? How did that happen? Yeah. Why can't we go back to not doing that? And I think the plastic bag ban is a fantastic piece of legislation that can only help. Yeah, so related to that, we saw that you were recently interviewed with the BBC about your work and appeared on television. So what was that like? Oh, that was quite cool. It looked like it was only a two minute clip, but actually the BBC were down with us for about a week making those (laughs) films. So um, we would run through everything several times and we had all sorts of other films that they took off on the, our boats and in our laboratories and they've kept out those films for later use. So it was pretty cool. I think they, they approached us and they had heard about our research and wanted to come and do a clip for the BBC News to coincide with the plastic bag ban. So it's, it's really, really nice to think that the research that you're doing is actually reaching a wider audience. And on that topic, so what is next for your research? What's next? Well, we're hoping to do some studies of trophic webs. So we're hoping to take, we've, we've typically studied what's happening at the base of the food web and we're um, increasingly working with colleagues um, to study food webs that include fish and birds and um, higher organisms like turtles and whales. We want to really understand uh, where plastics and the contaminants that they take with them go and, and what they might be doing. So what is the main message you would like our listeners to take away from today? Um, stop chucking stuff into the sea. <laughs> well, that was very, very interesting and rather worrying too. I think it's safe to say that we should all be avoiding products containing microplastics in the future. Well, thank you, Tamara, Thanks for your so time. Much. Thank <laughs> you very much. Crikey, what an eye-opener. I can't believe every plastic bag is only used for around 20 minutes. Yep, and we have to check for microplastics in our cosmetics. If there's any mention of microbeads, polymers, polyethylene or polypropylene on your packaging, it's probably best to find an alternative. The good news is several companies are responding to consumer demand to remove microbeads from their products. For example, L'Oreal. Unfortunately, many supermarket owned brands are not responding, so it's up to us as consumers to make informed choices. There are other things we can do too to prevent so much plastic entering our oceans. For example, buying a reusable water bottle and refilling it means fewer plastic bottles are wasted and ending up in the sea. And we can also get involved in beach cleans, especially down here in Cornwall. And we can reuse and recycle. Lots of plastic waste can be broken down and reused. And now with the plastic bag charge, we have a greater incentive to use less plastic and think about the impact they're having on our environment. Well, I think that rounds up another Natural Selection podcast. Next time, we will be looking at the effects macroplastics are having on marine turtles. To keep up to date, you can find us on our website, naturalselectionpodcast.weebly.com, where you'll find links to our Facebook page, or find us on Twitter, at UOE Podcast. If you have any questions, or would like to suggest a University of Exeter lecturer that you think would make a good interviewee, get in touch, we'd love to hear from you. You were listening to the Natural Selection Podcast, brought to you by Alice, Natalie and Fiona. That's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Tune in next time for another instalment of the Natural Selection. Bye! Bye.